Hello, art history students. Uh, welcome to another little video lecture. Today we're talking about um, the art of ancient Egypt. So this is unit two and this will be uh, lecture three. So I put these two maps in here just to explain two quick things to you guys. You're probably familiar with ancient Egypt and um, at, at least from popular culture and whatnot, seen you know, movies or something that would have to do with ancient Egypt, and you're probably familiar with it from schoolwork. But just in here, just to kind of give you a little bit of reference, so ancient Egypt here is happening simultaneously with Mesopotamia that we talked about in the last lecture, and then also the uh, Salatic uh, Aegean people, these kind of pre-Greek culture. So all these cultures are kind of developing at the same time and another thing i want to point out which confused me when i was a student and i want to make sure you guys don't have the same mistake is the nile river runs south to north so this means that this part up here is lower egypt and then this is upper egypt down here and it just seems you know when you think something is lower you think south you know what I mean? And um, that just kind of threw me for a loop when I was learning. So I just wanted to point it out to you guys, some of these, just to give some context of where we're at in the world and whatnot. All right. So there's a couple major points that I want to put forward about ancient Egyptian art, and we are not looking at it in a very strict chronological way. There are several main points and main kind of ideas that I want to get across to you all. The first is that action is not important to ancient Egyptian art. And we'll talk more about that and kind of expand on that idea. But just keep that in mind as we go forward that action is not important. Another thing is, we're going to kind of go down here first, is hierarchical scale. We introduced this term in the last lecture when we talked about um, the Stella of Hammurabi, right? So this is, the idea of hierarchical scale is that the most important figure is the largest. It's scale with importance. And then another new term that is very iconic of ancient Egyptian art, and we'll talk about why, is twisted perspective. And this is where each part of the body is shown at its best advantage. So let's kind of break some of those things down. <clears throat> the first thing we're going to talk about is hieroglyphics real quick. So hieroglyphics are the uh, written language of the ancient Egyptians. So this is the second language that we've talked about. First was cuneiform from Mesopotamia. Sorry. So hieroglyphics are both phonetic and ideographic. So those words are important. So phonetic is sounds, A-E-I-O-U, right? Hooked on phonics from when we were kids. And then the ideographic is a rep image representing an idea. So let me kind of give you guys an example of how difficult it was to translate this language. So I learned this from a linguistics professor in college. So this is the kind of rough uh, image of the hieroglyphic for boat right and you can kind of see it's kind of like a little boat and it's got some little waves underneath it so it makes sense so this oh look at me drawing out so bad I should get a slide that's an example of this this where there's kind of like two of them on top of each other is a hieroglyphic that kept appearing right and they didn't understand what it was it was boat boat right it didn't make any sense so the sound for this is ba, right? Boat is ba. And then ba ba is father. So you can see how there is this relationship with an image that's an idea, a sound that is associated with that image, and then those sounds put together, right? It made deciphering this language very difficult um, because of this representation of images and sounds and sounds to images, it was very confusing. So what actually made it possible for the translation was the Rosetta Stone. So this is the Rosetta Stone, um, which has, it's very similar to the Stella of Hammurabi. It has three languages on it and it tells the basic 
uh, rules of the town or the area. And it's just written in a multitude of language, which shows that there is trade and communication between the people of Egypt and then the people of Macedonia and uh, ancient Greece, which like we said, is kind of like the Aegean cultures and whatnot. So we know that there's trade exchange of ideas going on because there's people traveling between these areas. Um, I just want to point out, like, there's this scene in the Mummy movie, if you've ever watched that, where they have to go to the Rosetta Stone and it tells them the location of something important. It does not. It is a, I don't want to say boring, but it's just the rules of the town. It's a very informative piece of art or object in history. All right. So this is the first artwork that we're actually looking at from the ancient, Egypt, uh, ancient Egyptians. And this is the palette of Nerman. So this term might be familiar to some of you, this palette, maybe maybe ladies might have a uh, makeup palette for eyeshadow in their whatever pocketbooks or bathrooms or whatnot. So that's what this is actually for. There's kind of this little section here, which is actually for the grinding of pigment to make that super iconic eye eyeliner that's associated with ancient Egyptians. And that is very, very iconic of this culture. So let's break down some other things that we see here. We see a clear use of hierarchical scale. This is um, Nariman, right? So he is the king. He is the, the most important figure on this object. Just so we're clear, this is two sides to the same uh, object. And then these guys over here who have sort of lost their heads are obviously the least important, right? They're the, depicted as the smallest. So what are we actually looking at here? This palette commemorates the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt, right? Lower Egypt and then Upper Egypt. It's a little bit, it was confusing for me at least. All right, so this is a very early time in ancient Egyptian history when these two kind of separate sections merged and became one large culture and one uni unified kind of state. And this was the ruler of what I assume was Upper Egypt. So he's depicted larger than many of these other characters, but he's still certainly not as large as the victor. So let's take a look at that body of Narman. Right, he has his shoulders kind of squared at you. His head is turned in profile. It's like one of his eyes has been placed on the side of his head, right? His feet are pointed away from where his shoulders are, right? So if you kind of tried to stand like that or put your feet like that, you would notice that this is not, a, this is not how people stand. Usually our shoulders, the same way that our shoulders point out, our feet point out also. But this goes back to that idea of the language being partially ideographic. So the ancient Egyptians are depicting their people in this really specific way because it's the most easy for you to digest vis visually, right? You get the most amount of information from this twisted perspective, right? That's what that's called. That's what that term means. And you're very likely to see it on a test. So twisted perspective, it's very intentional. It's not that the ancient Egyptians didn't know that people's eyes didn't exist on the side of their heads or something silly like that. It's, it's part of how they read and understood their art. Art was almost like a language to them. All right, so this is just some of that information. Um, clear use of hierarchical scale, indication of the important. All right. So here are just some kind of things that I want to break down before we go forward. So I said earlier that action is not important to ancient Egyptian art. And this is because of the idea of continuity, right? That is one of the, the main things that ancient Egyptian art is putting forward, right? Stability, order, endurance, endurance of a culture, endurance of an afterlife, endurance of the power of the pharaohs and the remembrance of the pharaohs and then sort of this this continuity or this endurance of the life force or the ka all right 
the ancient Egyptians really believed very strongly that their culture would last forever. Their culture, their belief structures, their uh, kings, their gods, they themselves would continue into the afterlife. So this life was not a self-contained thing that had a beginning and an end, right? It was just sort of like a step on a path. That's really part of what they believed. And that is one of the reasons why their art doesn't show a lot of um, action or drama. And we'll, we'll get more into that as we move forward. All right, so this um, portrait of this queen here has this incredible thing coming off of and out of the top of her head. So we talked just a moment about the life force known as the ka, or the sort of the soul, for lack of a better term. The ancient Egyptians were acutely aware that the head is where thoughts come from and thoughts are part of spirituality so we have this relationship between art and the sacred realm that's really important to ancient egyptian arts and this continues through most of history so think about um in the judeo-christian tradition there's the halo that's around the head of saints or you know of religious figures and whatnot there's this this knowing that something around the head indicates spirituality. So that kind of starts with the ancient Egyptians. Uh, that's a, like a debatable statement, but we're gonna kind of see that progress as we move forward in the class in general. So we're just kind of bringing it up here and it really shows their importance for this kind of ka or life force. All right, so this is an image from the Book of the Dead. This is the last judgment before Osiris. So here we see Osiris. He's sitting down. Let me get a different color so you guys can see, right? He's clearly the largest, right? Clear use of hierarchical scale, All right? So what's happening in this image is this individual is a, um, I don't want to say a regular person, but a important person who has passed on and is now being judged before Osiris before they can enter into the afterlife. So they are certainly not as important as Osiris, right? There's another person back here who's sort of waiting in line. This is the god Anubis. This is the god Toth. And then this is the god Horus, right? And we see that animal-human hybrids happening Again, we also, again, see hierarchical scale. These people are less important than anyone else. All of these people who line this top area up here are the part of the lineage or the relatives of the person who's being judged. They are um, kind of coming to witness this moment for, for lack of a better term. So. We're seeing hierarchical scale. We're seeing um, kind of some of the importance in the cultures that's going on. And then we're also seeing that twisted perspective, especially here with Osiris. We're gonna kind of use him as the example. Look at how his shoulders are facing us, but yet he's all twisted, right? If he's like turned to the side in a chair, it's not a natural pose. And that is because it's for your benefit. I keep kind of pounding this point but i want to make sure you understand that all right so moving on in the ritual of the afterlife which is what most ancient egyptian art has to deal with in one way or another is the power of the pharaohs and or sort of like the the pharaohs or the gods and then their association with the afterlife so we're going to kind of talk about that quite a bit these are canopic jars they would hold vital organs in the body, which you would need in the afterlife. So there's kind of this theory, I guess, that you would pass away, you would be mummified, these organs would be removed. And then after you were judged by Osiris and you would kind of go into the afterlife, you would need these essential organs and they would be there with you and you could kind of pop the top and I guess put them back in. I'm not, you know, I mean, it sounds silly. We can laugh, we can make, a uh, funny about it but this was very important so one of the things to note is the brain is one of them so i know that there's the brain the heart the lungs and i believe the liver 
but again that they know that this is the spiritual center of the body is the head all right so this is the funerary mask of Tutankhamun this is not the first funerary mask that we've seen so you may or may not see one or more of them on the test right so this is um, completely made in gold Tutankhamun passed away very young in uh, his reign so there is a likelihood that this was kind of a, a, a rush job or created very quickly which is it's very well crafted for that reason but one of the things i want to point out is the ancient egyptians believed that the sun and the sun god was kind of the the main the main the main guy in the pantheon of gods this group is polytheistic i think we said that earlier but that's kind of the the leader of all the rest so gold was perceived to be this object that fell from the sun little bits of the sun had fallen down so gold represents the sun's life-giving power right so this object is not used in the same way that we use gold today gold today is like a status symbol if you have gold you know you're going to show it off with jewelry or those kinds of things gold was strictly meant for religious purposes and look at all that adorns this funerary mask it's made of gold it's inlaid with precious gems it has kind of this childlike face right Tutankhamun passed very young so we kind of have this very um almost tender portrait right he's kind of got a pudgy face and whatnot so that is all there but this object was probably seen by 30 to 60 people right for as much wealth and value as is physically there in the just the raw materials not even the craftsmanship to be seen by so few people is strange right it was seen by the people who made it the priests that would have kind of mummified Tutankhamun and then maybe the people who laid it into the um the tomb the final resting place that's very few people right for such wealth to have just been seen by so few and i think that goes to really prove to you that this material specifically gold was not a material of wealth or value other than religious value that's where all of this value comes from to the ancient egyptians very different than today there is a little youtube video about that i will link it below it is optional you don't have to watch it but it talks a little bit more about the um gold and how sort of the the importance of gold to ancient Egyptian art and shows a little bit more artwork than we see in this little video here. So I highly recommend it, but it is optional. All right, the next vocabulary word, this is a vocabulary heavy um, little lecture, is registers. So ancient Egyptian art is always broken down by these parallel, horizontal, sometimes vertical lines that break down space so why are they breaking down space like this so part of it is is that their imagery is read kind of like a language right so you kind of we break down lines of text this way so it kind of makes makes sense a little bit in that terms but there's also this idea of continuity which is this theme that flows through all of the art and all of the decisions that the ancient egyptians are making and so this is an image of this is actually like a kind of like a recreation drawing. I have tried to find a actual image and it's so kind of degraded that you can't really see what's going on. But I like using this one as an example because it's servants making bread and beer. So bread and beer have some similar similar um, things that are used for them. Yeast is one of the uh, ingredients in them and whatnot. So there's this step process if you add the yeast and the flour and wait and bottle the beer and wait and warm it and all the if you go through all of these steps you're going to have this outcome which is bread or beer right so this is part of kind of kind of just sums up the ancient egyptian idea of continuity 
this if I live my life and then when I pass away, I am mummified, I will be judged by Osiris, I will go to the afterlife and I will continue. There's this continuation that's happening that these people sh very strongly believe in to the point that it all of their decision making about their art is part of communicating that to you as the viewer. So there are very, very few exceptions where registers are not in the artwork, very, very few. And they almost always deal with hunting scenes or sometimes scenes of war. And why would that be? Because the outcome is unknown. You do not know when you go hunting if you will catch whatever you were hunting and how many you will catch of whatever you were hunting. Same way with war. There, there is this unknown element of uh, will you be victorious or not? So these very few depictions that lack registers, right? We see this line down here. This is actually the water line and there's sort of like fish underneath of it and whatnot. And this is just a little bit of a hieroglyphic text telling us who is who, right? We see clear use of hierarchical scale and the twisted perspective. But all of this kind of chaos of all these animals is based around that, the chaos of the unknown. Right. And the ancient Egyptians didn't have that as part of their kind of belief structure. There was no unknowns. They would if, if this series of steps was taken, there would you would achieve the afterlife or go to the afterlife. And then there was eternity. Right. It was all about eternity. All right. So here is a really good example of the falcon god Horus, right? We can see him here. He kind of has his wings wrapped around the head of this pharaoh, which is Khafre, I believe is how that's pronounced. I'm really terrible at pronunciations. And again, it makes sense. So there's this representation of the god, right? The falcon god Horus, and he's up here near the head, right? That's that's very important, that placement, right? It's reinforcing some of these other ideas that we've seen. Another thing I wanna point out is look at his face and his ear, right? He's in this three-dimensional representation, we do not see the use of twisted perspective. So it's obvious that the ancient Egyptians did not misunderstand where our eyes were on their head. They were very intentional choices that they were making for you as the viewer, which was themselves at the time, but you know what I'm getting. All right, so here we're going to look at the sculpture of the pharaoh Menkora and then his wife Kamirbati or Kamir Kamirbati. I'm really terrible at those pronunciations, but let's take a look at this pharaoh and his queen. So he stands here very, very erect, right? One foot right in front of the other. He has his shoulders are very square, right? He's kind of in the prime of his life physically, right? Same way with, with her. And they're standing there very, very, very rigid and uptight, just that one step, right? There's no gesture or action or anything like that that's going on in this image. And that's very intentional. So let's compare and contrast real quick. So this is the bull leapers, which we would have seen in um, from the Aegean culture in the last lecture, right? So these images are not created at the same exact time in history, but we do know that these two cultures are developing at the same time. So even though these exact images are roughly a thousand years apart, that's that's nothing for, for the ancient world, right? It's not that one culture is sort of ahead of the other or anything like that. It's just that there's differences in what they kind of value. The ancient Egyptians really strongly are communicating the power and the endurance of their ruler. You cannot knock um, Menkarni down, right? He, he is not prepared for a leg sweep. If you tried to leg sweep him and knock him down, he would just stand rigid, right? He's that kind of strong in his stance, which is very different than what we see in this bull leapers image, which is full of action. There's people leaping and jumping and animals are moving, right? It's full of motion and action. 
So this image of the, this king and queen is not, not for nothing how it's laid out, how their bodies are represented. So the ancient Egyptians used this part of the palm of the hand as a unit of measurement. And there was kind of this ideal, the ideal body would have very specific amounts of this space to represent certain parts of their body, right? So here we kind of have this, this detailed layout of how many width of the palms of the hands were used to depict the body. And she, Kamirbati, would actually have her own. So the width of her hand was used to create her body and the width of his hand was used to create his. So this is applied to these two bodies for this ideal human form. It is very unlikely that either of these people looked this strong, right? The ancient Egyptians believed that their pharaohs were descendants from the gods or kind of had direct blood lineage to the gods. And thus they believed that their royal family should keep that lineage. So there was quite a bit of inbreeding amongst the pharaohs uh, to keep that bloodline pure for lack of a better term. So it is probably much more likely that both of these characters, or not characters, but both of these people were probably very frail, potentially deformed, but they're not depicted in that way. They're depicted as very strong, virile, um, the strength and power and continuity of Egypt is what they personify. All right. So here is another example. You can kind of see that same kind of grid pattern with the use of the palm of the hand to depict other images also. So this was not just for three-dimensional work. This was also for two-dimensional work. And you can kind of see how it would make sense with their representations and their use of hierarchical scale, right? If set width is for someone who is really important, uh, or if set width is standardized, you could then kind of increase that for making someone more important. You would use a larger palm size, basically. All right, next we're gonna look at the pyramids of Giza. Sorry. All right, you are probably familiar with these. You've probably seen these before, All right? There's some names that we've seen, seen before. Khafre, that was that image of that uh, that sculpture of that man who had the falcon god Horus at his head, and Menkarn, Menkorin, right, who's the, the super strong barrel guy that we just saw. Okay, so what I want to kind of get across to you guys is where these pyramids are located. So this is the Giza temple complex and we see all three of those and then we see many other tombs surrounding these areas right all of these others areas are, are lesser tombs that are not as big the pyramids of the queens down here um, things of that nature and then all the, the people the actual physical ancient egyptians who were living all lived over to this direction, which was where the actual river was and where sort of more fertile lands were. So they never lived amongst these tombs. And I think that that is very important to note because of this idea of you live here in this life and you live here in this life. And the only thing that's happening when you pass away is this lateral movement, right? There's no kind of end to the to the life that we have here it, it obviously continues it just continues in this different place in this different location so that is a very big driving force in why they're making so much art why they believed that this the eternity that was the afterlife was more important and bigger than the life that we lived here, which is why they devoted so much time, so much attention and so much energy on the building of the pyramids, on the art, on the going, that always communicated something to do with the afterlife. That was the ultimate goal of the ancient Egyptians. All right, 
Now we're going to talk about a time when things were just a little bit different for a very short period of time. This guy named Akhenaten reigned for about uh, like 17-ish years he was the pharaoh and he changed everything and then basically after he was no longer in charge ancient Egyptian art and everything went back to the way it was before. So Akhenaten tried to establish monotheism. So let's look at look at an image of Akhenaten. So this is Akhenaten here with his wife, Queen Nefertiti. So you can kind of see this is Akhenaten and then like this is Nefertiti. This is their one god, which was the sun, right? Which was Aten is the name of the one monotheistic god that they tried to kind of push forward this belief of. And then if you look at Akhenaten's body, you can really see a difference in the depiction. This is a, probably a much more realistic depiction of what this man looked like, right? He has these spindly little ankles and wrists. He does not look at all uh, strong, right? He looks very weak and spindly, right? He has this kind of beer belly thing that's kind of coming down over his shirt, right? So I said earlier that there was a lot of inbreeding within the pharaohs and sort of the upper uh, crust of uh, ancient Egyptian society because of that belief of the gods, right? And this bloodline of the gods. So Akhenaten is kind of pushing back against a lot of these things for for very strongly for just the ability that there was so much art and whatnot made in such a small period of time no uh other pharaoh ever would have depicted themselves in such a, a weak manner right a physically weak manner even though they probably did look a little more like Akhenaten than anyone wants to believe so and then this singular sun up here. So I wanna just kind of throw a theory out there just to kind of bring some ideas together that may or may not be, uh, this theory was put forward by uh, Sigmund Freud. So Akhenaten is the second child and it says in the, Jewish tradition that Moses was the son of pharaohs and Moses kind of pushed forward or was one of the bigger leaders of monotheism in the Jew Jewish tradition. So there's this theory that these guys maybe could have been brothers kind of pushing forward because potentially the timelines line up. Again, this is a theory. I am not saying that this is true, but it's kind of linking cultures again or linking ideas. So I'm just throwing that out there. Just remember that Akhenaten's very much so not, not a, a, a virile depiction of himself. Another thing that we're gonna point out is sunken relief. So if you look at this image, the figures are what are carved away, which is different than boss relief, which we learned about in the last lecture. So if this were boss relief, the sculptors would have carved away all this negative space, right? All this space here. And then there would have been a raised kind of image of the figures. In sunken relief, it's like the people have sunken into the surface, right? So you guys may or may not have to identify the difference between those two on the test, which I'm sure you can. All right. This is a bust of Queen Nefertiti. Again, she was always depicted with this large headdress, as was Akhenaten. Um, and again, it's that idea that this, this is where the spiritual center of the body is. And these people, these pharaohs and queens, would be considered to be closer to that spiritual, the gods, right? Or the sacred realm. So it makes sense that they would accentuate their kind of with these kind of large hats, right? The the Pope wears this specific hat, right? There's kind of like this parallel that we can see between accentuating this in a spiritual sense, right? You can you guys can see that connection. All right, next I wanna ask a question, all right? This is Dora the Explorer time. So what is this? 
right? These two things and then the space between them. What is that? It's post and lentil construction, right? So building off of this before we get to the next time, the ancient Egyptians begin to add decoration to this kind of little area right here, which is the kind of the top of the post. And they often decorated all down the post when they did post and lentil construction. But this little top area, what we kind of see in these images here is this is called the capital. So we're building on that vocabulary, that little top section that touches the lentil is called the capital. And then that will become very important in two lectures when we get to ancient Greece. So. All right, these are your monumental terms. As always, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to uh, email me. I am happy to answer any questions at any time. Uh, good luck, remember to check on your discussions and um, thank you. <laughs>